All right, so here in this video, it's kind of a funny example of dealing with this in the legal system. So if we think about what just happened here, what we have is a case where a cop has pulled over someone because they suspect, right, that the person has been drinking and is driving under the influence. So if we apply kind of our six step process here, okay, it starts with the cop having an alternate hypothesis that they choose to research, right? So it's their research hypothesis. So the hypothesis of the officer is what? The individual is driving under the influence. So the, the null, which is, again, the nullification of that statement is that the individual is not driving under the influence. That's like the baseline assumption under the distribution of the null, right? That people don't all drive drunk, right? So we would assume that the person is not driving drunk under the null hypothesis. So the claim is that the person is drunk the null is that the person is not drunk, right? So then what does the officer have to do? Well, believe it or not, there's kind of a sampling distribution here because in the back of the officer's mind is this kind of set of behaviors of what would I expect to observe in a person who is not drunk, right? So again, it is the distribution under the null hypothesis. That is what do things in a world where the null is true, what do they look like, right? So in a world where the null is true and this person is sober, what sorts of things would I expect to observe? And those could be behaviors, those could be speech patterns, those could be an individual's ability to walk a straight line, and a variety of other tasks. Now, understanding that people can perform these tasks with some degree of variability, both in sober and in drunken states. So we don't want to conclude that this person must be drunk simply because, for example, they missed one step on a line, right? There's some degree of natural variability that can occur. Some people have better balance than others when they are not drunk. So the question is, how far from that expected value does the person have to be for us to conclude that they are in fact inebriated, right? So again, it's not enough to just say there is a difference. We have to know if that difference is meaningful. That is, is the difference unlikely to occur simply by chance, right? And so we do step three. We've got this distribution. Okay, what do I expect people to look like if they're sober? I then do what? I have to collect some data. So that's what the officer does with the like goofiest field sobriety test ever conducted, right? Reno 911. Uh, so they do this sobriety test to observe all these behaviors. And then what you have to do is you have to compare what you've obtained, you know, the statistics, the, the values. In this case, we have just observations for the fun of it, right? But you get some value, some statistic that says, how did this person perform? And you would compare that to that expected value under the null, which is again, what you expect from someone who's sober. So then when we make that comparison, we have to now decide, is the difference between what we see, the statistic we've gotten from our data, is it different enough from what we expected that we would say, we should reject the null. That is, we think it is unlikely to observe these patterns of behavior if this person were in fact sober. And that then would lead us to conclude that they are not sober, that is, that they are inebriated. So obviously, you know, this guy does a phenomenal job, like who can do the alphabet backwards, even with the whole sing song thing, I love it, right? But so not only is he able to do that, uh, but he's able to do all kinds of other things. So that data would suggest, wow, he seems very, very, you know, functional. But then, of course, at the end, he admits that he's been drinking. So that kind of gives it away. But this is this is the process, right? And, and so you note that we do this type of stuff all the time in life. And actually, if we apply this way of thinking, we can make better decisions in a lot of contexts, right? It is so easy for us to, you know, want the world to be what we believe it should be. So rather than testing, right, rather than saying, you know, this is what I want to believe. Well, but hold on. Is there really evidence to believe that? Like, what if I assume a position of skepticism and then demand evidence before I move to that position of belief? Um, it can help us make a lot of good decisions. And you think about avoiding things like snake oils in the past and, you know, how do people decide bloodletting works and all these types of stuff are great examples of confirmation bias kind of throughout history, which is a really common phenomenon cognition, whereby people, they tend to find evidence that supports their pre-existing beliefs. And there's another type of bias where 
whereby people are unlikely to move from positions of belief that they've already formed. So you, you continually kind of interpret the world as fitting your beliefs. But here in science and in data, we have to demand that whatever I want to claim, whatever I want to think about the world, I actually have to first assume I am wrong. So that's kind of a fundamental skeptical position that is, is unique in the epistemology of science and hypothesis testing from a statistical perspective. So when the officer has a claim, I think this person is drunk, they can't just act on that and assume they're right, right? They have to assume they're wrong and get evidence, right? And so this is kind of a very useful way to behave and to think to make decisions that really need to be accurate as much as possible. It's really easy to think that all of our decisions are just right because we wouldn't make them if we didn't think they were right. But science says that's not enough. You have to put it to the test. So we demand first that you assume you're incorrect, right? So you have a claim. My first thing, my first response is I assume your claim is not true. Then we get data. We compare that data assuming that you were wrong, right? That your claim is not true. And if that data is unlikely to occur in the context where your claim is not true, then I then have evidence that your claim may be true, right? Again, please note, this does not ever prove your hypothesis is true, right? We are not proving hypotheses. We are saying what is the probability of obtaining the data we have under the assumption that the null is true. That is what these tests do. So the thing is, this decision is just a decision. It is not the truth. Again, we don't know the truth. Right? We do these tests because accessing the truth is just not possible. And so we make best decisions we can based on available evidence, right? And first assuming the position of skepticism, because again, it has no positive claim to make and therefore no, no burden of proof. So when you have a positive claim to make, you have a burden of proof. So we, we test the data and we try to decide do we reject or retain the null? But that decision isn't the same thing as the truth. It is just the decision we make that is, is the best probability of being correct given the information we presently have, right? And so there are actually four possible outcomes as a result of our decision. It's easy to think there's only two, right? I decide to reject or I decide to retain and that's all there is to it. But if I reject the, the null hypothesis, I could be wrong in that rejection. And that would be called a type one error. Now, if I reject an all hypothesis and I was correct in doing that, that would be a valid positive, right? But if I retain the null hypothesis, but I'm wrong about that, that would be a type two error. But if I retain the null hypothesis and I, it was true, I should have retained it, then that would be a valid negative. So notice, there are two possible decisions, reject or retain. And then there are two possible realities, that the null is true or that the null is false. So that two by two results in four possible outcomes, right? And so here in our example, wrongly rejecting the null. Again, what was the null? The null is that the guy is sober. If I reject the null, then I conclude he's drunk. But if I am wrong in concluding he's drunk, then I called him drunk, but he was really sober. That would be a type one error. So a type one error here is basically arresting an innocent person. A type two error would be if I retain the null hypothesis, right? Which is that I conclude he is sober, but I was wrong to do so. So he was really drunk, but I concluded he was sober and let him go. So this would be letting a guilty person get away. A valid negative would be where I retain the null and I am correct to do that. So again, the null that he's sober, if I keep that idea, I keep the idea he's sober when he really was. I let an innocent person drive away. If I rightly reject the null, I reject the null means sober, not sober. I conclude he's not sober, right? And I'm correct in doing that, so I arrest a guilty person. Now notice, all four of these things happen, right? I mean, whether you talk about policing or any other possibility in the world, we have times where we think we're right, but we're really wrong. We have times where we go, oh man, yeah, I guess I was wrong, but you were really right. We have times where we think we're right and we really are. And we have times where we think we're wrong and we're really wrong. So these things happen. You know, cops arrest innocent people. 
cops arrest guilty people. Cops let innocent people go. And, you know, all these different things can happen. So what we want to do is set some kind of threshold of how willing are we to let these things happen, right? And we often do this in science by regulating type 1 error. So we say, how willing am I to wrongly reject the null? How willing am I to go, oh my goodness, look what I found, when you didn't really find anything? In this case, it would be, how willing are you to arrest a person who is sober? Right? We often set this alpha value at 0 0.05, which means that we're willing to, 1 in 20 times, arrest an innocent person. Right? Now, you might think that sounds awful, but the fact of the matter is, whenever you change one of these values, it changes the others. Right? They affect one another. So, in science, we often want no more than 0 0.05, that is, no more than a 5% chance of wrongly rejecting the null. We want at least 80% power. Power is another term for valid positive. So to be able to rightly reject an all, we want to be able to do that 80% of the time. So that means that when I pull over someone who's really drunk, I want to be able to identify that they're drunk and arrest them 80% of the time, right? So we often set these thresholds like that, which would mean if- well, 1 minus beta is 0.8, then beta is 0.2. And if alpha is 0 0.05, then 1 minus alpha is 0.95. Okay? So these are the thresholds we often set to try to regulate how likely it is that we're making uh, a false conclusion. So you might also hear the terms valid positive, true positive is another phrase for that, right? You might also hear um, true negative, right? False positive and false negative. And so those are all kind of synonyms for these things. So you can have a true positive, a true negative, right? This is a false positive. Type 1 error is a false positive, And this is a false negative. So all of these things happen. And we already talked about a little bit when we talked about Bayes and, and testing that it can be really hard to get at the truth of these numbers sometimes. But in hypothesis testing, we set these things to try to regulate how, how likely we are to make a mistake. So here's kind of how you can think about it in a two by two matrix, right? There are two possible conditions in the real world. The null hypothesis could be true or the null hypothesis could be false. There's not really another choice, right? In the world, one of those two things is true, okay? So if the null is true, going back to our drunk driver example, then I pulled over someone, but this, some, this person is not actually inebriated, right? They are sober. If the null is false, then they're really drunk. Okay, now in the world where they're sober, I can reject the null, which would be a type 1 error, or I can retain the null, which would be a valid negative. Those are my two options in the world where the null is true, right? In the world where the null is false, there are two possibilities. I can reject the null when it's false, which is a valid positive, or I can retain the null when it's false, which is a type 1 error. And the thing is, you don't know which world you're in. So you could be in the world where the null is true. You could be in the world where the null is false. You don't know that. That's why you have to do a test. And so then you make a decision based on your test. And your test decision could lead to a correct or an incorrect answer in both worlds, right? So this is the state. And this is why in science, it is so important to do replication, you know, to follow these processes, to be honest about results to replicate findings, to conduct multiple tests, to go based on the bulk of evidence, right? That is the best way to make decisions uh, is using these types of processes and using the bulk or preponderance of evidence to, to move your decisions on topics. So you can also think about it kind of as two distributions. So you have a distribution under the null, right? And you have a distribution under the alternate. So if you think about it, going back to our example, the distribution under the null would be like the behaviors that you'd expect from someone who's sober. So imagine we have here, you know, on the X axis, like the number of times they step off a straight line, just making it up to make sense, right? So for people who are sober, you would expect them to step off a straight line fewer times than you would, for example, than people who are drunk. So the world under the alternate, right? You would expect people stepping off straight lines more, so they're further on this X axis, right? So you can look at these two overlapping distributions and you can see that there are times where we're going to get some decisions wrong. 
So the first thing we do in science is set an alpha value. And we set this value usually at 0 0.05. That's the convention, right? Which means that one in 20 times we will commit a type one error. We will reject the null when the null is true. And that is this little black space right here. So you see this little black shaded area. These are the cases in the null distribution that are extreme. And they're extreme enough that they pass our threshold for alpha here. And therefore we decide that these belong to the alternate, but they actually belong in the null. So these would be people, for example, who have really bad balance. So they step off the line a lot, but they're actually sober. They just have really bad balance. And their balance would be so bad that we would conclude that they're drunk when they're really not drunk. And that would be a type one error. So the first thing we do is we set this alpha and we regulate how willing we are to conclude that someone is drunk when they're really sober. And you notice if you were to slide this alpha so that you did that less of the time, you would also end up missing cases, right, in the alternate distribution. So the further I slide this to the right, the more of the alternate also fails to meet my threshold. So again, it's a balancing act and it's really hard to say, well, what matters more, you know? Is it worse to throw out the cure for cancer or is it worse to tell the world you found the cure for cancer when you really didn't, right? Those are the two types of errors you could make. You know, throwing out the cure for cancer would be a type two error. It'd be concluding the null is true when it was really false. You really found something, but you go, oh, no, nothing. Wow, that's horrible, right? Well, but at the same time, to conclude you found something when you really didn't and say, look, I found the cure for cancer and get everyone excited and then like it doesn't help anyone. That's also very, very unfortunate. So it's hard and we probably should be very thoughtful in the decisions we make regarding which thresholds we set. But we do have conventions in science and most people kind of stick to these conventions. So if we go back to thinking about the other things, beta here would be this tan space. So beta are the values that truly belong to the alternate, but that because they don't pass our threshold that we set, we decide to retain the null. So this is, this is also an error. So the black space is an error and the tan space is an error. This is a type one error. This is a type two error, right? Because this is where we retain the null, but really these people were drunk, right? So these are people who are drunk, but that have good balance even when they're drunk, right? So we conclude that they might, that they're sober when they really were drunk, okay? So again, we have two types of errors we can make here. We also have two pop, two types of valid decisions. So one minus beta is power, right? And so these are valid positives. These are people who, because they exceed your threshold, you conclude they're drunk and they really belong in the distribution of the alternate, that is the world of drunk people, right? So this is a correct decision. We also have valid negatives. So these are the people who are in fact sober that you decide are sober and you're right in doing that is this white space and it would obviously overlap here into this space, right? So this is that 95% or 0.95 probability of correctly concluding that a person is sober when they are. So those are the four things that can happen and that's how they would look if you look at them in a distribution. Now, when we do these tests, we often have to make a decision do we want to do a one-tailed test or do we want to do a two-tailed test? Now, a one-tailed test takes your 5% alpha and sticks it all in one side of your distribution. So, for example, these hypotheses are hypotheses that are directional, such as girls have higher GPAs than boys. And in that case, I would only want to look at the right side of the distribution, right? Um, those types of things. Now, in science, we almost never actually perform one-tailed tests even when we have directional hypotheses. And the reason is mostly because it is more conservative to always do a two-tailed test. So a two-tailed test takes your 0.05 alpha and splits it so that 2.5% is in the bottom tail and 2.5% is in the top tail. Now, this means that for a value to be extreme on this right side, it's gonna have to be further out. If you notice here, this value is further in closer toward the middle of the distribution. And this value is further out, closer to the tail of the distribution. So this demand scores be more extreme before we become convinced by them. So very typically, we in fact will use two tailed tests, even when we have directional hypotheses, okay? So if you think about this in a, in a non-directional hypothesis statement, you would simply say, 
I believe girls and boys have different GPAs, right? Or unequal GPAs. And this then would test, you know, are they different in either direction? But even when we form a hypothesis that directional, such as girls have higher GPAs than boys, in science, we almost always still perform a two-tailed test. So the conventions in science are generally two-tailed tests with a 0.05 alpha.